Hello, I'm Dr. Ralph Hughes. In this lecture, I discuss how organizations empower employees by assigning them to meaningful tasks. Yes, it is true that organizational leaders can actually empower employees in a number of ways. One way is the rewards program. Leaders can actually give their employees a number of rewards that will motivate employees to do a better job or empower employees to continue the job that they're doing. The problem I have with some of the rewards program programs is we in organizations, especially in governmental organizations, which prides itself on a transactional leadership approach, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me neither, and I'll explain to you why in a second, uh, is because the transactional approach is pretty much a quid pro quo. You give me something, I give you something in return. Well, I shouldn't give you a reward for simply doing your job. You are paid a wage or a salary for performing your job on a daily basis. That's a simple, it's essentially why you're paid to do your job. So for me to give you an award or to give you a bonus for you to simp simply do your job doesn't really motivate, it doesn't empower employees, it actually demotivate employees. And there are a lot of studies out there that also suggest that when you give employees meaningful work, that truly empowers them more than financial bonuses. The reason organizations engage, governmental organizations primarily engage in a transactional approach, and the reason I said that I don't believe in this notion of transactional leadership is because everything that we know about leadership is inherently good. So everything that we know about leadership, if in fact if, if it's inherently good, how can this transactional approach be really leadership? It's more of a management approach in my purview. It is definitely a management approach on how to give something to employees for them to continue doing the job that they're paid to do. That's something being an award or a bonus. That's not leadership. Leaders, leaders empower employees. How do they empower employees? Well, again, by assigning meaningful roles, meaningful tasks. What does not empower employees? There are a number of things that do not empower employees. One being micromanaging. Uh, if you have someone who's a micromanager, I, for example, I don't like to be micromanaged. The reason I don't like to be micromanaged is because I think I'm pretty self-sufficient. Uh, you give me a task and I'll get it done. If I have any questions, I'll definitely ask you along the way. But for the most part, all you have to do is tell me one time and one time only. And for the most part, that task will be accomplished. That doesn't negate the fact that you do have some employees that you do have to micromanage, but the leaders have to understand. They need, they must know which employees they must micromanage, that they have to micromanage, and those employees that they don't need to micromanage. So that's understanding your employees as a whole in terms of micromanaging. Again, someone like me, if you micromanage, that is not empowering to me. That suggests that you believe that you can do the job better than me, better than I can, which may be true. Um, the other thing too is that you probably do not have any faith in me that the job is going to be accomplished in the fashion in which you want it completed. So I may not be the right fit for that particular task or goal. And that's why I said that assigning employees to meaningful tasks truly empowers them. I always like to use the example of the New York City Police Department because in, it's a good example that I can use to illustrate um, exactly exactly what I'm saying here. So the New York City Police Department um, comprises of various units uh, within the entire police department, such as you have the highway patrol, uh, you have the mounted police, you have the motorcycle uh, brigade. Uh, you have uh, the park patrol, you have transit, you have housing, you have a detective squad, uh, you had an un have an undercover squad, 
you have a training um, facility with uh, training officers as well. You have uh, field training officers. So you have various departments within or various units within the department structure or the departmental structure. So if you have an employee who starts out, let's say, as a regular patrolman, and he sees himself as being a detective one day. Well, obviously, there are steps in order to become a detective. But at least it gives him something to look forward to. What the New York City Police Department did, before you become a detective, especially using narcotics, the narcotic squad, for example, you can actually request to work as a, um, a plainclothes officer or an undercover officer. If, especially if you work as an undercover officer for uh, several years, primarily about 18 months or so, then for the most part, you will be promoted to a detective. So that gives that officer something to look forward to. What also helps is giving the employees meaningful tasks, meaningful roles. It says that I value you as an employee. I know that you bring certain skills and abilities to the table. Because you bring these skills and abilities to the table, I'm going to utilize those skills for the betterment of the organizational mission. And as the employee, it's okay. We will allow you to use us to the fullest. The reason is because now we feel a sense of purpose. If I feel a sense of purpose, then I feel that I can contribute wholly to this organization. I can contribute freely to this organization, that this organization values me. And if this organization values me and value my skills and my abilities and my traits, my characteristics, they understand where I'm coming from as a person and as an employee. And because they understand that, because they know that, because they believe in me, I believe in the organization. When I believe in the organization, the organization will undoubtedly flourish as a result of that. When you provide meaningful roles for employees, they also look at how innovation and creativity can come about. Innovation and creativity can run rampant in organizations if you allow the freedom or the latitude of, of employees to do that. One of the things that I like to talk about is called the SWOT, S-W-O-T, which is a strategic planning and management tool that was created by Alfred, Albert Humphrey in the 1960s. Al Albert Humphrey was a scientific manage management, excuse me, scientific management consultant for major organizations. And he created the SWOT analysis so organizations can determine where they are and where they are headed because the best predictor of the future is your past and your present. It will determine ultimately where you're headed. So as far as the SWOT analysis is concerned, the S stands for strengths, the W stands for weaknesses, the O stands for opportunities, and a T stands for threats. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Yes, well, organizations must know their strengths, they must also know their weaknesses. They have an understanding of their opportunities and they have an understanding of the threats. I always like to use the example of the $5 wars um, with these, the $5 lunch wars is what I'm referring to primarily with a lot of the uh, fast food establishments such as McDonald's, uh, for example, and Subway. Now, I remember when Subway had the uh, $5 sub, foot-long sub, and they the profits pretty much exploded. They made profits exponentially within a short amount of time. And McDonald's uh, looked at that, and they said, well, how can we capitalize on this? So they created their $5 sub, um, I'm sorry, their $5 war as well. Uh, they just didn't know how to approach it. What they looked at in terms of their threat being Subway, they actually created, McDonald's created, McDonald's actually created 
what is called a wrap, a McWrap sandwich for $4.99. That was their response to sub the Subway's $5 footlong sub. Now, McDonald's also had to look at their strength. I always like to use this as an example, like I said before, because the strength that McDonald's has is his name, is brand recognition. McDonald's. McDonald's is known all over the world. One of the weaknesses of McDonald's at that time was that they, they had unhealthy food. Well, the president of McDonald's uh, went on record by saying that it's a hamburger establishment first and foremost and that people have the right to purchase as many hamburgers as they wish, or as little as they wish. And don't quote me on that, but he says something to that, um, to that effect. And there are some opportunities. I always look at the opportunity last instead of the threats last, simply because in order to understand opportunities, you first must understand the threats that are out there, the threats that are on the horizon. For example, again, McDonald's looked at Subway as being a threat because of the $5 sub. Well, how could they capitalize on this opportunity? Well, one of the things that McDonald's looked at, again, is a $5 wrap, a Mick wrap. So when they looked at the Mick wrap, that was their opportunity to that threat. So... How does this correlate to an individual? You can actually use a SWOT analysis for individuals as well, and it doesn't have to only be used for an organization. For example, if I want to work, or let's change this a little bit. If I'm an organizational leader and I have five available positions, positions available for this one particular department, and I may have 50 uh, candidates. I don't know which candidate would be the best fit for this particular job, this particular unit. So what I could use is a SWOT analysis. I can have each and every prospect complete a SWOT analysis and I can make that decision. Look at their strengths, look at their weaknesses, their threats, some opportunities. By looking at that, I can determine who would be the best fit for this division. Also doing that and allowing employees to work in various departments, various units within the organizational structure, again, it gives the employee purpose. It gives the employee meaning, a sense of shared purpose, if you will, the purpose with not only other fellow employees, but also purpose with the leader as a whole. Now, the leader is, in essence, responsible for creating that culture and also responsible for exhibiting what is referred to as the language of leadership. The language of leadership is how the leader uses language to empower others. And how the, the leader empowers others is simply by speaking with empathy understanding each and every employee brings certain certain knowledge skills and abilities to the table capitalizing on that tapping into that talking to employees uh, from that perspective the language of leadership not only speaks with authority but also speaks with conviction letting employees know that we are here for you I am here for you. I believe in you. I love you. I trust you. I know that you're going to do a great job no matter where I place you. By doing that, it creates that environment for employees to flourish. When you create that environment for employees to flourish in terms of innovation, creativity, in terms of empowerment, the skills that they bring to the table, that organization as a whole will flourish. Because understand, the whole goal of the leader is to ensure that the mission is adhered to, that the mission is accomplished, period. So what do we do if we have an employee who's not pulling his or her weight, so to speak? Well, if you have employees that are pretty much not working out 
in one particular department doesn't mean that that employee is not a good fit for the organization as a whole. Don't let the, the employee leave or don't terminate the employee. Find something meaningful for that employee to do. Just because that employee is not good in one area, that employee may flourish in another area. So that's something that we must look at also as leaders. So leadership truly in terms of empowering employees in that organizational behavior construct, of course, you have to make sure that you provide the meaningful work to employees. But in order to, to provide the meaningful work to employees, you have to first put them in those units, those departments that they best fit. And by doing that, the organization will flourish as a whole. Hello, I'm Dr. Ralph Hughes. In this lecture, I discuss emotional intelligence and how leaders must be emotionally intelligent in order to satisfy the organizational mission. Primarily, the critical issue surrounding leaders in the 21st century is truly understanding or learning the fundamentals um, of emotional intelligence and understanding the importance of that. The reason organizational leaders must understand the importance of emotional intelligence is because that may determine the future of the organization. It is as simple as that. Let's look at emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence deals with two domains, the affective domain, which is all about emotions, and the cognitive domain, which is basically the thinking. So we want to look at how those two are interrelated. What you have to also look at when you talk about emotional intelligence is the leader's ability to perceive and express emotions, how the leader uses emotions to facilitate thinking and understand and reason with emotions, and effectively how leaders manage, excuse me, how leaders effectively manage emotions within oneself and within others. So understand that there are a lot of mismatches when it comes to leaders and employees. Primarily, what happens is that the boss play a crucial role in determining the team's productivity that comes from Jacob. Shurness talks about the relationship with the supervisor that determines the time on the job. A lot of times that when you look at employees, there may be a mismatch with the employee leader relationship, but primarily it is the leader that has to work with employees and how leaders work with employees effectively really is determined upon the emotions or the emotional intelligence level or quotient of the leader in relation to working with employees. So Understanding that a key component of leadership, essentially is what I'm saying, is the emotional connection that leaders create with others. So if, if leaders are not attuned to their own emotions, they, they cannot effectively lead. Simple. They cannot effectively lead. So let's look at emotional intelligence. Where does this come from? Well, emotional intelligence was first created by Solovi, Mayer, and Caruso, college professors. They came up with the four branches of EI, or emotional intelligence. EI simply means emotional intelligence. So when I say EI, I'm re really referring to emotional intelligence. So the four branches of EI created by Solovi, Mayer, and Caruso are perceiving emotions, facilitating thought, understanding emotions, and managing emotions. Now, Emotional Intelligence, the book entitled Emotional Intelligence, was authored by Daniel Goleman in 1995. Daniel Goleman pretty much set the stage, the grand stage, if you will, for emotional intelligence. And as we know of emotional intelligence today, it was emotion, uh, Daniel Goleman uh, created that pivotal time where we in organizational uh, leadership 
wanted to understand more, learn more about emotional intelligence. And Daniel Goldman created the opportunity for people to really understand emotional intelligence. So again, Daniel Goldman took that, the, the emotional, emotional intelligence framework um, that Solovi Mayor Caruso created uh, and just expanded up, uh, upon that body of knowledge. Initially, Daniel Goldman studied children and the neuroscience of children. Uh, Daniel Goldman uh, was, in fact, a neuroscientist, and he created, he authored several books on emotional intelligence and some books on emotional intelligence in relation to leadership. So when we look at EI, there are four components, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. Self-awareness is basically the ability to recognize and understand your own emotions and how they affect your life and basically your work. Leaders with a high level of self-awareness learn to trust their gut instinct, their feelings, and realize that these feelings can provide useful information about difficult situations and decisions. Self-management is basically the ability to control disruptive or harmful emotions. And it includes trustworthiness, conscientiousness, and adaptability. Social awareness is the ability to empathize, basically to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And this component includes a service orientation, which refers to ability to recognize and serve the needs of others, needs of employees. Relationship management is how leaders connect with others and build positive relationships and how they inspire others with a powerful vision, for example, how they develop others, how they cultivate others, how they coach others, how they mentor other um, employees. So emotional intelligence affords the opportunity of leaders to understand the influence that they have on employees, of course, in a positive way. So looking at the components of emotional intelligence creates that strong base that leaders can use to effectively guide their organization. A high level of awareness combined with the ability to manage one's um, own emotions enable leaders to display self-confidence and earn the respect and trust of followers because essentially followers determine who the leaders are. Leadership is not indicative or inherent upon any title or rank. Just because you're the captain, just because you're the general, for example, or the team leader, doesn't mean in essence that you are in fact a leader. Leadership comprises of characteristics, traits, and certain abilities that are inherent of that position being a leader. Followers determine who they want to follow, thus they determine who the leaders are. Also understand that the emotional state of the leader impacts the group. So if a leader has low emotional intelligence, that means that if they come to work upset, is noticeable, they lash out on employees, what do you think is going to happen with the work production amongst the employees? What do you think is going to happen with the morale amongst the employees? That is what we have to look at. That's what we have to be aware of and be mindful of as leaders, that we have to be in a position to truly, to truly control our emotions in every situation, in every scenario. We have to have a high emotional intelligence quotient in order to relegate ourselves, manage our emotions, and of course we have to understand our employees, who they are, what makes up uh, the, the employee's characteristics, <laughs> what makes up the employee's traits, what do we need to do in order to deal with our employees effectively, how do I manage my employees in every scenario. That is a sheer definition of emotional intelligence, truly understanding how I am as a leader, what I need to do as a leader in terms of interacting with my employees, 
and also how I interact with them and how I manage their emotions as well. So that's that's really pivotal, pivotal um, because the positive effect on the leader follow relationship has everything to do with emotional intelligence. Leaders must also be humble. They have to show that humility. They extend themselves emotionally to their followers. By doing this, they gain their trust and their admiration. They truly do that. One of the things that a lot of uh, leaders, or I should say organizations do, they take personality tests. It, it, personality tests, they provide valuable information to the individual and the organization about their attributes for leadership and where the individual could best serve the organization. That's why personality tests are used. And there's something that's called the EI, uh, EQ or the EIQ, which is the Emotional Intelligence Quotient. Uh, also the LTQ, which is the Leadership Trait Questionnaire, the Myers-Briggs uh, Type Indicator, the MMPI, which is the Minnesota uh, Multifacet Personality Inventory. Um, basically, it assesses the uh, leadership behavior. These, the MLQ primarily, the multi-factor leadership questionnaire is one of my favorite. Um, it talks about transformational leadership and how it assesses the leadership behavior. The MLQs measure um, a leader's behavior in basically seven areas. Uh, it talks about the four factors of leadership, contingent reward, management, management by exception. It looks at the laissez-faire behavior. Um, and high scores on the uh, individual consideration of motivation factors are more indicative of a strong uh, leadership base, and not only in terms of emotional intelligence, but also in terms of transformational leadership. Primarily, that's with, with the um, MLQ. So looking at these uh, personality tra uh, questionnaires can really, really help. One of the personality questionnaires that I don't recommend is the MMPI. The reason I don't recommend the MMPI, not because it contains over 500 questions. It, is, it, it in fact, it assesses a wide variety of topics, including interpersonal relationships, uh, ethics, um, but also it, it does little in terms of looking at EI or emotional intelligence and does more so looking at individuals and how they may have some um, mental uh, limitations or uh, mental disease and things of that nature. So that's why I really don't recommend the MMPI for organizations when they're trying to determine um, the uh, personality or the traits of leaders. Now, I also talked about the ML MLQ, and again, just with, and I also talked about the pros and the cons of the MMPI, and I really talked about the pros and the MLQ, but to be fair, there are some cons with the MLQ as well, which is the multi-factor leadership questionnaire. Oh, it's challenged by some researchers, and um, it has a trait-like quality, and it, it may, may also appear to be elitist or undemocratic. Norhaus in his book, uh, Leadership Theory, uh, talks about this as well, which I really appreciate because looking at the pros and cons, you can determine which leadership questionnaire is best suited for the organization. Leaders are empathetic. They have to be empathetic if we're talking about emotional intelligence. Well, empathy is the most important trait of a leader. Leaders who are empathetic, they have the ability to listen. They put others' needs above their own. It becomes critical. Empathy, emotional intelligence as a whole, becomes critical for leaders, especially as they progress. The reason is because they have to be in touch with their employees. The higher they go up the, the ranking structure or the hierarchical structure, the less in touch that they may be with their employees. Uh, there are some governmental organizations where the employees talk about how they started out in the organization. They started out with a, a fellow employee who several years later um, was promoted to a supervisor, but yet they were still in touch with that leader. Um, that supervisor then a couple of years after that 
uh, was promoted to um, an, another uh, position uh, higher than a supervisor, and they c continued to rise uh, up the hierarchical ladder. And the further they went up the ladder, the more distant they became with their employees. They became totally out of touch with their employees. Their employees really didn't see the leader in the organization. They read a couple of emails and a couple of letters that came from the leader, uh, not really to check up on the employees, but really to tell employees about new processes, new procedures. Um, and again, we want to see um, our leaders in, in organizations as employees. We want to be able to have a conversation with our leaders. We want our leaders to be down to earth as much as possible. We understand that leaders are extremely, extremely busy. One governmental organization also, um, the leader had what he called as uh, town hall discussions. He knew that a lot of times he would be out of the country or out of the state, but what he did every three months or so, he made it a point to see each and every employee. He couldn't go to each and every employee's uh, office, couldn't go to uh, make a phone call to each and every employee. But what he did was he allowed employees to have a sit down with him and talk about things that are taking place in the organization and just talk pretty much about everything and anything, whether it's personal um, or professional. Uh, things that people really wanted to share, like having a baby uh, or a wedding or things of that nature. So it, it, it afforded and created that bonding opportunity for the leader with his employees. So again, um, having emotional intelligence, high emotional intelligence means a lot for the organization in terms of how leaders interact with their employees. Low emotional intel intelligence, you will have some issues in the organization in terms of your worker buy-in, not being able to feel empowered uh, to do the job, having high emotional intelligence as a leader, understanding my emotions, understanding how to uh, manage the emotions of others truly affords the leader the opportunity to really, really interact with each and every employee in the organization without having preconceived notions of the employees and truly being able to manage that employee, listening to that employee, empowering that employee would only equate to organizational effectiveness.